I was thinking about when he said uh, that 23 people just, just this month so far. And praise the Lord, I've been telling people, you know, it's been really receptive, especially in that in that neighborhood and everything. Praise the Lord uh, for that. And, and uh, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, man, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're just trying, you're just making numbers up, 23. There's no way 23 people got saved. And then he starts reading this, and what's it say in verse 4? How many of them, uh, which, how be it many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. <laughs> Where did they come up with that number, you know? Uh, were they just, uh, I don't think they had time to watch all those people and see how they lived and, and whether or not they got baptized and joined the church. It just says they believed and, uh, and they, were, they were added uh, there to them. And so, uh, you know, it talks about them at the end, the multitude of them that believed. But I got a hard time believing just 5,000 people just from that day forward were like, you just tell us, man, we'll do whatever you want, follow the Lord and, and all that. But no, but, but, you know, everywhere Paul went and the workers with him, he was preaching the gospel. He was doing the work, you know, doing everything that he could, committing himself to preaching and ministering. But I'm telling you this, not a lot of people followed him. Not a lot of people went with him to do that. And uh, it's evident whenever you read his writings and he's in a jail all by himself and he's like, everybody's forsaken me, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it kind of makes me think about uh, Jesus as well. Jesus the same way, you know. He's going out there doing all these wonderful works. Multitudes are following him when they think that, they're going to receive something from them, but as far as actual laborers, there were few. There really wasn't that many. I got to thinking about that and, and, and other things uh, in regards to evangelism. I mean, praise the Lord, this work here is an evangelistic ministry, of course. Uh, I, I consider us basically missionaries. I mean, it's a mission work that we're doing here in Kansas City, trying to take the gospel door to door. And, uh, and praise the Lord. God's blessing that. I really, do, I really believe that. You say, well, I just don't know if everybody that says a prayer gets saved. Okay, so what's the point? <laughs> We're still taking the gospel. We're only, you know, recording those who actually said the right things and said they believe that and, the, and gave the right answers as to why they believe that and called on the Lord to save them. And so we just say praise the Lord for that. If we just wanted big numbers, I can guarantee you there's a lot of people that we didn't count that said prayers and, and did various things, said they believed. We're not just trying to build up numbers, right? If, now, and if anyone is, if we're like just prideful and just, yeah, well, look how much greater works we're doing than everybody else, well, then the Lord's going to tear us down real fast on that. But that's not our goal. Our goal is to do what Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so that's what we're trying to take that seriously. Uh, obviously, we could do much more. And in my own life, <clears throat> one thing I've been thinking through this whole thing with the coronavirus and, and all this, as I've been thinking, as Christians, I come to this conclusion so much in my life, I'm not praying enough. And I think about that when I read the Bible, like prayer is so huge. And I remember one time take, doing a little series uh, with this group out here on prayer, and it wasn't long before I just kind of forgot. In fact, some of the things I'm talking about tonight, I've probably already shared it uh, before. I know I preached it in Iola before, and I at least made mention to it with you guys and but it doesn't take long to just kind of forget that and uh, you know I've been to a lot of meetings revival meetings and in, uh, in independent Baptist churches or youth rallies or, or uh, different things like that where people said man we really need to be praying they have like prayer meetings before the event happens uh, I remember uh, one thing that particularly in my mind is the group, uh, we took some young people out. Actually, I, we've never taken anyone except my, for my family, but we were looking at this as a possibility for taking some of our young people out there from the church. And uh, it was in uh, uh, Marion Avenue Baptist Church in Iowa. I can't remember the name of the town, but anyway, it's not important. And so they every year have this huge youth rally. And uh, all these people come from all over. A few, a few different churches from Kansas go out there as well. And and uh, we went there, and man, they just spent a lot of money, put on a huge production. But it's not just all about show. I mean, they're really, they've got a bunch of preachers up there, and they preach really hard. And after every sermon, the altars are full and all this kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and I remember thinking, man, these guys, they just put a lot of work into this. And here's what he did every service he'll have uh, before the preaching. He'll, he'll say all, you know, we've been praying about this for weeks, you know, prayer meetings with the church and everything. And he says, uh, all those people, ministers, youth, 
youth workers, pastors, whoever wants to come into the pastor's office, we're going to pray before this meeting because we just want to bathe this thing in prayer. And so everybody goes in there and, and they're praying, crying out to the Lord, work in through the preachers, you know, and get this gospel message out to all these kids and all that kind of stuff. And they got one thing in mind, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not tearing them down, okay? I'm saying this is, this is not a bad thing, uh, but just bear with me for a minute. They got one thing in mind. They want at the end of that preaching for the altars to be full and people have made decisions to the Lord and people get saved. And a lot of people do supposedly get saved. Uh, uh, you know, I will share one story. It was kind of funny. The first time we went, I was like, man, it's amazing. Altars are full. People getting saved. And then the preacher got up there afterwards and said, oh, man, look at all these. Because uh, after, they, after they deal with somebody at the altar, they would give them these altar car cards. And then uh, he has this big stack of these cards. And he's like, man, all these people came forward. He, let me just name a few of them. And he was like, so-and-so. He called out someone's name. Where are you? Where are you? And this girl stood up and he said, looks like right here you called on the Lord to save you today. Is that right? And she said, <laughs> and he was like, oh, uh, we'll get someone to talk to you. He put that down. He's like, so-and-so. They stood up and he's like, did you get saved? Mm-mm. <laughs> So, and I was like, that backfired, right? That backfired. But I'm not saying nobody got saved there. I think a lot of people did. And the preaching was really hard, and you felt like, man, the, the Spirit moved in here and all that kind of stuff. But here's what the point was. I remember at that point being convicted. When we have any kind of services, you know, special services, preaching, invite a lot of people in or whatever, we didn't really put in a whole lot of effort in prayer. And I've been a lot of places where they have prayer meetings before the services and all that kind of stuff. I've even heard of, how many of you heard of, I can't remember if it was D.L. Moody or Spurgeon or what, but there's a story that while they would have prayer meetings before the, before the preaching, and then during the preaching, have you guys ever heard this? I think underneath the floor, there was like this secret room or something like that. Have you heard this? And apparently people would go into the room and they'd be praying while he's preaching, you know, that, God, that the Holy Spirit would work among people and all that kind of stuff, just praying in this, this dedication of prayer. So... Now, let me tell you my thoughts on that. I'm not against any of that, okay? And I think that's good to pray before services, and we should be people of prayer, no doubt. But when it comes to evangelism, and the title of the message tonight is Prayer and Evangelism. There's a link there. I really do think there's a link. We should be praying, and that should be connected with our efforts in evangelism, reaching people for the Lord. And so prayer and evangelism. And so here's what I was thinking all these revival meetings, all these youth rallies and all this kind of stuff, here was the goal. Let's do what we can, have the big production, get all the people into the church. We'll preach the gospel to them and they'll get saved. But we need the Holy Spirit to work. We need the Holy Spirit to open up eyes and hearts and he need to bless the preacher so that he can preach really well and all that so that these people will get saved. So the motivation was evangelism, right? But you guys know as well as I do that that's not the way we do it here. Our evangelism is out there. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. So we go out there. We go door to door, just like examples in the Bible and preaching in various ways at work. Afterwards, don't work on the clock that's stealing. I mean, don't uh, give the gospel on the clock that's stealing. But, but after <laughs> work, hey, can I talk to you? Uh, Brother uh, Nick, I know, has done the same thing with coworkers and, and different opportunities, family members. It's not always door to door. Sometimes someone's in their car, sometimes someone's walking down the street or in the park or whatever. But the idea is to go take the gospel outside of these walls. Right. Why? Because everybody in here should be safe. <laughs> right? Well, shouldn't we just have a big production and bring everybody in here and all that? No, really, the purpose of the church is to take those people who are already saved and begin to disciple them and teach them the Bible right. and show them how to do that and, and go get other people saved, right? So our job should be to come in here and to learn about the Bible. Yes, pray. We should pray together. That's one of the things we should do when we meet together. But our evangelistic efforts are done out there. But shouldn't we be just as serious about praying as those guys are for a revival meeting and for uh, uh, youth rallies and all that? Most definitely we should. And we will definitely pray. Uh, on occasion, I forget, and somebody will remind me, hey, aren't we going to pray first? We should pray before we start knocking on doors, and we typically try to do that. Uh, but shouldn't it be so much more that we're praying? Praying is part of our lifestyle, really, as Christians. That's what we should do. When we come together like this, pray. You know, before we go out, pray. If there's something coming up, like a mega marathon or some pre maybe spend a, a extra time 
praying, you know, and so prayer should be a, a, an active part of our lives. And I was just convicted about that. I often, often am when I realize that I'm not really uh, spending the amount of time spiritually making an effort in prayer. I'm just, you know, physically trying to trying to do things on my own power. And we got to be careful not to do that. So I wanted to address that topic again. And as I began studying, I was reminded of a message I preached a long time ago. And I don't remember the message very well. And I certainly don't expect anybody else would remember. I don't think I preached it here. I'm pretty sure it was an Iola. Uh, but I probably made mention to an acronym uh, that, I, that I used in that message that I preached, BOLD. You guys remember me saying, I wonder if anybody, don't say it now, but anybody remember what it stands for? Okay, good. So this is all new <laughs> for everybody. Okay. So I had this acronym BOLD, B-O-L-D, and that's going to be the points of the outline uh, tonight, okay? But it's all right here in Acts 4, and I don't know where I got it before whenever I, uh, whenever I preached it. I don't actually think it was here. But, uh, but as I was studying this specific chapter, I thought, man, that's the, this is basically these are the points that I feel like we should pray in regards to evangelism. All right. I mean, you pray whatever you want, but I think these are things that we can find in the Bible. I uh, won't be able to look at all the examples, but I can take you to other verses in the Bible and back this up. These are things when it comes to evangelism that we should be praying for. Number one is this, the B. We should pray for boldness to preach the gospel in whatever situation. I mean, Paul told, uh, you know, he says, pray without ceasing, pray for all men. You know, he was telling all the churches to pray. And then sometimes he would say, pray for me, you know, that, that, that I'd be bold in my preaching. And I get the idea. We look at P Paul and all the different stories of him giving the gospel and boldly standing before rulers and stuff like that. And you say, man, he was a bold man. But actually, I read in between the lines in some stories where you see that he actually went to people in fear and trembling. And he actually reveals that in a few letters about himself that, that actually it wasn't necessarily easy for him to stand before all those people. But what we read is just him actually doing it. But I believe somewhere between the time he was in prayer, you know, God help me overcome this fear, and people are praying, Lord, help Paul be bold when he stands before these people and preaches the gospel, Paul was able to forget about his own fear and his own self and all his own uh, desires and, com and comforts and stuff like that. And said, I'm just going to stand before these people and boldly pro proclaim the word of the Lord. How did he get that boldness? All right. So I want to look at this real quickly. Look at verse one of our text in Acts four. He said, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. OK, so he's preaching here in this people of authority, rulers, you know, they come to him and they're going to confront him with some things. And, I, and I'm telling you, when we have confrontation, it's it's just rough. That's when you really are put to the test. You know, and you're like, man, everything was easy up until this point, And now there's comfort. Somebody's yelling at me, you know, uh, uh, different things. But I'll tell you what their secret was before I go any farther with that. Look at verse uh, 13. In verse 13, it says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that ha they had been with Jesus. It's like, man, something's different about this guy. He's just an ordinary guy. I mean, he's not like some master, you know, been to seminary and got all the doctrine degrees. <laughs> he's just a normal guy, but he's been with Jesus. You know, there's something about this guy. Look at uh, verse 29, same text, uh, same chapter. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Look at verse uh, 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were, uh, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You see how boldness is connected to the fact that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now you go back to... Uh, uh, the, the start of, of what happened in all this stuff, you see that uh, 
in Acts chapter 1, this is right before, I mean, Jesus had just ascended, right? And so now uh, they're, they're sitting there waiting for what's going to happen next. And you remember, they're all meeting together and they're praying and all that in the upper room and, and trying to figure out what they're supposed to do next. And then you remember the next thing that followed is the Holy Ghost comes upon them. They begin speaking in, you know, where all these people understand in their different languages. And they were actually filled with the Holy Ghost. All right. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, don't get ahead of me. <laughs> I'm not talking about this weird feeling where we just start speaking in, in strange languages. OK, that was what happened to them on that day. Uh, but they did pray for the power of the Holy Ghost and they spake through his power. And all preaching, if you studied this through the Bible, David, it doesn't matter who you're talking about, Noah, I can even show you where Noah, his preaching was through the Spirit of Christ or through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the power of the Lord was upon him whenever he preached the gospel. And you see there in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, they were told this by Jesus. Acts 1, 8 says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, in verse uh, 14 of chapter 1. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplications uh, with, with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with the brethren. Okay, so you see they were praying praying for the, for the filling of the Holy Spirit, praying that, they would, that the Lord would fill them and work through them so that the works that they're doing aren't their own works. They're actually works that the Lord is doing through them. You say, yeah, but well, we don't do that anymore. You want to bet? <laughs> when you go out there and, and you stand before Sadducees and priests and the captain of the temple, and they're saying, what are you doing here? You're not going to muster up enough strength. Now, there are some people. It seems like, uh, there are these kind of uh, 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 guys who grew up in the hood who like fighting, you know. They like, uh, they like, there's kind of scru scruffers, what they, what's it called? Uh, they, they, liked, they liked wrestling with each other and stuff like that. It does seem like some of those guys, when they get saved, become very effective soul winners. You ever notice that? I've known a lot of those guys. They just like to boldly go in. But look, if you're doing that in your own power, you're going to get in the flesh. You're going to be getting in fist fights. You're going to be doing all that kind of stuff, right? That's not what I'm talking about. That's why sometimes it seems like what God really wants to use is the humble person who maybe is even a little timid and doesn't. Some of the most timid people can be the greatest soul winners. You would see them and think, that guy is never going to be able to win someone to the Lord. He's so timid and scared and doesn't want to do anything. No, no, no. The Lord, if he's doing the work, he can do mighty things through that person. Okay, by preaching the gospel. By the way, that's what we do is we preach the gospel. And that's what the Holy Spirit helps us do in this day and age is to get the complete word of God and just preach it boldly. All right. And that's when the Holy Spirit begins to work. We can't just necessarily, you know, just work, try to impress people with our own craftiness in our own words. I mean, I try to do that all the time and I fall flat. <laughs> you know, that's not where the power is. The power is in the word of God and, right. and, the, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. So here these guys are standing before the captains and the priests and, uh, uh, and the Sadducees. These are religious rulers. Uh, and it makes me think of Daniel 3. Let's go ahead and go there real quick. Daniel 3. Daniel chapter 3. You know this story here where Nebuchadnezzar is uh, he builds this uh, uh, great statue and all the people all the people are supposed to bow down to the statue whenever the instruments play and all that and look at verse 3 it says then the princes and governors and captains and judges the treasurers the counselors the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of uh, the image uh, that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image of Nebuchadnezzar uh, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. I thought about the sheriffs. <laughs> I thought about. I'm glad we've had no persecution. No, I mean we had we had the police called on us three times during this coronavirus thing, uh, where we were preaching the gospel and somebody called the police and they came. But you know what? The only one I ever dealt with was I, I said, "Oh, are we doing anything wrong?" He said, "No, you guys are good." And he just drove off. He just, I just want you to know somebody called. 
that wasn't really that scary. It was like, great, man. We, in fact, it was kind of liberating. Hey, the, the police officer actually showed up, but he said, no, you guys are good. That gives me, uh, you know, I don't have to worry about it. if somebody else, not, if someone else says, hey, I'm going to call the police. I'll be like, hey, call him. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm okay. But imagine if you're out there preaching in a drive-in. I mean, you guys have been watching the news, I'm sure, a little bit. Okay, imagine I'm out there preaching in a I'm trying to obey the best that I can. And I say, hey, we're just going to have a drive-in service. People can stay in their cars. They can roll up the windows. And, uh, and, and they can listen to the radio and hear my preaching. We're going to do the best that we can. And then eight police officers pull up. And they're like waiting, you know, you got a group of like 10 cars out there, right? And eight police officers pull up and they're like, hey, are you going to really preach right now? Because you're not supposed to be assembling. And, uh, and if you do this, you're breaking the law. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, man, what do I do? <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Or if you're out there knocking doors and somebody actually says, hey, if you keep doing this, I'm going to take you to jail for resisting arrest. You think that's ever happened to anybody? I can give you some examples where that's happened. You know, hey, I'm just out here trying to give the gospel to people. Yeah, well, this is a neighborhood where you're not allowed to do that. Okay, officer. Okay, officer. It's going to take the Holy Spirit power to be able to stand during that time and say, I'm being bold and I'm going to proclaim the gospel and I'm going to take my stand and say, hey, I got to obey God rather than man and all that kind of stuff. That takes boldness. And I'm going to tell you what, I can't muster that up just naturally. I need the Holy Spirit's power uh, to be bold in those kind of situations. When somebody confronts you in any way, we've had people come out yelling, you know, what are you doing here? You know, if I want you, I know where to find you. I'll come to you. You shouldn't be knocking. You're just disturbing people. You know, you need to get out of here. And then you say, all right, hey, it's fine, man. We'll just leave you alone. And you go to the next door and they're like, get out of here. He doesn't want to hear. He's not home either. Man, isn't that just kind of, doesn't it just kind of grate in your nerves? And you're like, well, let's go to a different neighborhood, man. I can't handle this anymore. <laughs> Those types of things are scary, man, and they, and they kind of make you not really want to do it. And really, to, in, 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 in a way, that's pretty much where all the fear of soul winning comes from, is the fear of rejection, the fear that somebody might not like it, and they might get mad at you. If we didn't have that fear, it would be, soul winning would be so easy. <laughs> Just memorize a few verses, go up and share the gospel with people. But we get scared because we're like, no, some people aren't going to want to hear that. They're going to tell us to leave. They're going to yell at us. They're going to think we're being offensive to them or whatever. But we want the Holy Ghost to empower us that we might boldly preach the gospel. So the first thing we need to pray for is boldness. And we need to, I'm, I'm talking a serious prayer, not just, you know, uh, a now I lay me down to sleep type prayer where you just say, pray, Lord, please give us boldness to go out and preach a word. and all." No, I'm talking about sincere, begging God, crying out that he gives us boldness when things really get rough. Now, beware, he might put you through the test if you're praying for that. <laughs> He might give you the opportunity uh, to put this to the test, but you're going to rely on him and pray that he'll fill you with the spirit so that you can endure that. That's what he said he was going to do. Uh, and so this is uh, what we need to do to rely on him is number one, preach for boldness. Number two is the O. We need to pray for opportunities to preach the gospel. Okay, we got boldness, you know, I, I I know that through the power of the Spirit, I can go out there and I can boldly proclaim the gospel. Okay, now what we need is opportunities to do that, <laughs> right? We need uh, uh, opportunities. Now, obviously, you know, we are not expecting that God is going to ha give us another day of Pentecost moment, you know, where it's going to come down in some supernatural way that everybody can see this great, these great signs and wonders and all that. I don't have time to preach that now, but... Uh, those were things that happened during these days, and they recorded it. And now we have a, a, a more per, a more sure word of prophecy right here. We got the entire word of God, and people need to believe that by faith. Okay, but we still need to go out and preach that, and we need dif different opportunities. If you look at in Acts four, the situation that they're getting, uh, they're having trouble for is because they were going into the temple, Peter and John. And when they got into the temple, uh, you know, we will sometimes drive down the street and see somebody on the corner with the sign, you know, saying, please help, um, um, hard times or whatever. They're trying to get some money. And you don't know, like, are these people being serious? I mean, it looks like they got two good working legs and, you know, they could probably go out there and work and, and all that. They, they know how to read and write. I mean, they wrote the sign, you know, <laughs> they spelled everything right. And, and so they could probably find a way to make some money. 
But in those days, people that sat there at the temple begging for money, they had no, there was nothing else they could do. You know, maybe they were just blind. And in those days, it was really hard for blind people to, to make ends meet. Uh, they were lame and nobody would hire them. They were just kind of castaways. You can go to places today like India and places like that, and it's the same way. It's kind of like a caste system. And these guys are just like the outcasts of society. Nobody wants to, you know, they're lame and impotent and, and all that. And so they don't, uh, uh, they don't amount to much. But, but Peter and John were going into the temple to pray. And it just so happened that they saw this guy. And they were able to use this opportunity. Let's go ahead and read uh, verse, uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. They saw this guy sitting there. They could have been like, hey, I don't have time for you. Sorry, I can't help you. I don't have silver and gold and just kept on walking. But they said, you know, I do have something I can give this person. And you look at the Bible and you see a lot of times where Jesus took opportunities. Ladies sitting at the well, right? And he's just sitting there and he's thinking, let's see, this is a great opportunity. He says, you know, hey, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water, right? What are you talking about? And he starts this conversation. And he begins to say, I am uh, the, I can give you living water, you know, I can give you eternal life. And he goes and uses that as an opportunity over and over. You see men of God in the Bible using using just opportunities. So a couple things about that is, number one, we're going to need to notice those opportunities, right? <laughs> How many times we've walked right past uh, somebody? One of the worst stories that I like to tell, um, I don't like to tell it, but one of the worst stories in my life is, uh, when we moved to Iola, uh, one of the things we did is with the kids, I was like, we're going to put a garden in the backyard, raise some vegetables, and, uh, and show the kids how to do that and work and to pull the weeds and all that. It'd be good for them. And we started digging that vegetable garden. And the neighbors, all the, we have a lot of old people in Iola, and, uh, and the neighbors are older. And, uh, and the stories that I was told when we moved there, I said, oh, that neighbor over there, man, he's a mean guy. You, he won't want to talk to you. You know, you just he'll stay to himself. And that guy over there is a mean cuss and, and all this kind of stuff. And, but, you know, when we started doing the garden and they saw kids walk, uh, working in the garden, they started driving their lawnmowers over. Er, what y'all doing? <laughs> started sharing all these tips about, you know, gardening secrets and stuff like that. And started loving my kids, you know, and they're always giving us tools and stuff like that. Saying, hey, and I was like, man, this is a great opportunity. And at that time in my life, I, I didn't have maybe the same desire for soul winning that I do now. Sometimes I still struggle with it, to be honest with you. Some people have a little bit more naturally within them to just like, man, I got to, you know. But see, this is what we need to pray for. Lord, give me that burden. Help me see people and be moved with compassion. Help me see people and recognize opportunities. The lady at the cash register, you know, that I see every day and I've been building a, uh, you know, a conversation with them. Help me just ask her, you know, give me the boldness. Give me the words to speak that I might uh, talk to them about the gospel. I mean, we need to recognize opportunities. And this guy here, man, uh, I, I remember one time he came over and he was talking to me a little bit about the, the garden and everything. And I began to ask him, I said, well, you know, I go to I go to the church down there, whatever. He said, yeah, I know. I, I know who you are. And I said, uh, you know, do you ever think about like where you're going to go whenever you die? You think you'll go to heaven? He said, no, I'm going to hell. And I was like, well, you know, you don't have to. And I began to think about ways that I could share the gospel with them because he kind of cut me off. It was kind of like, I don't want to talk about it kind of a thing. And I began to think of ways that I could share the gospel and go back and talk to him. But I put it off and I put it off. And next time I saw him, I just kind of waved and put it off, put it off. And I'm thinking, Lord, you know, I need to have an opportunity to talk with him. And then we went to uh, camp and uh, with the kids. 
you know, uh, there's two, two weeks of camp that we go to at, at Camp Sagmont. And we went there, and at the end of that week, we had a phone call from that one of those men uh, that, that, that said he knew he was going to hell. And we got this phone call, and he said, uh, uh, this lady said, I just wanted to let you know that my father, and she said his name, and she said, just passed away. And I remember just thinking, and I told the kids, and they were crying, and they were like, all I could think in my head is he said, nope, I know I'm going to hell. And all I said was, well, you don't have to. But, I, you know, in my heart, I'm thinking I could have said so many other things that day. I could have went back to him the next day, pleaded with him. I could have done so many different things. But life kind of gets a hold of us, and we start doing our, our, our regular activities and living our own life, and we forget that people are dying and going to hell. We are in a time right now where everybody's like, you don't understand. People are dying out there. You need to stay home <laughs> and quarantine yourself, right? We don't want to spread the germs. And I'm thinking, yeah, but we want to spread the gospel. <laughs> if they're really dying, we need to tell them the gospel, right? And so what's happened? We've gone out and we've said, Lord, keep us safe. Help us not spread anything bad or whatever. But we just want opportunities to preach the gospel. And look what's happened. More than usual. People have been receptive. The Lord's led us to people uh, who are able to listen uh, to the gospel and to get saved. Praise the Lord. But we need to look for those opportunities. And part of praying that the Lord would give us opportunities to preach the gospel, uh, part of that is our benefit. You know, I think He will provide us opportunities. But part of it, if you're constantly praying for people, well, let's put it this way. If you're praying for somebody, it's kind of hard to be mad at them. You know what I mean? If, you, if you're praying for that person and then all of a sudden they do something against you, but you've been praying for them constantly, you're probably, it's easier to forgive them because you've been praying for them, you know? And that's the way it is in our prayer life. If you're praying for an opportunity to give somebody the gospel, man, the next time that opportunity comes, you're going to be like, oh, this is the opportunity. You're going to recognize it. So part of us praying for that, and I think as part of us, we start looking, but then also God will maybe reveal to us, this is the opportunity I'm giving you. This guy that's walking by you right now, you know, and don't quench the spirit. The spirit, you've, you've felt that before. God telling you, I need to talk to this person. Don't quench that. All right, God's giving you that opportunity. He's giving you that, uh, that opportunity that you need. So we need to notice those opportunities. And... We, we should be prepared. Memorize scripture. Uh, get you a plan of how you're going to present the gospel. All those things are good. I'm not belittling that at all. You need, we need to do that. That's the least we can do to prepare ourselves. But let me tell you what Matthew 10, so I'll just read it to you. Matthew 10, 19 through 20. Great chapter. Uh, if you want to just read the whole chapter, it's when he sends the disciples out. And he says, uh, I'm sending you out, you know, and he, they go two by two. And he's saying, you know, you're, you're just you're going to go preach the gospel of the kingdom to them and everything. And he says, I send, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. And he starts to tell them some negative things. He says, people are going to deliver you up and, and all this. He already says, verse 19, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak but the spirit of your father, which speaketh in you. Now, I'm not suggesting that you say, well, just forget about having a plan. It's not that you should be ready. You should, have, I mean, you think these guys didn't know, uh, you know, biblically what they're supposed to say. Uh, yeah, we, we should know what we're going to say. But don't just be so focused on that. I've met people that are like, I memorized all the scriptures. I know my plan, you know, but what if they ask me a different question? <laughs> have you ever heard that? What if I don't have the answer to the question that they ask? And sometimes they will pass. We, we all can be guilty of it. We'll pass opportunities because we're like, no, I'm just not prepared for that. Another time a guy uh, moved next door, a younger guy this time, wasn't an older guy. And, uh, and I remember his name was Casey and he'd always ride a little moped around town. And he's kind of like just temporarily living with a friend. And he came over one time I was working in the yard again. It wasn't a garden, but it was a, a laying some bricks, a little path there. Right? And, and he came and just started striking up this conversation with me. And I was like, man, this is awesome. And my neighbor just came to me and just started asking, uh, asking all these questions. And I started asking him a little bit about if he went to church and what his background was. And it, it wasn't very clear that like he understood the gospel. So I was like, man, I need to really present that. I, 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 thinking back, I wish I would have 
you know, right off the bat. Say, hey, you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? But at that time, I was still under that mentality of, well, you got to build a relationship and you got to, you know, spend some time with them and make sure they're ready to hear it. I mean, that's what I've been taught my whole life, right? And so I was just thinking, man, I need an opportunity. I need an opportunity. A couple days later, I mean, we had a great conversation. He was telling me all about himself and everything. A couple days later, he comes and he knocks on my door and he's got his Bible open. And he's like, man, I've probably shared this with you before. I don't know. But he has his Bible open. He's standing at my door. And I, I, was getting, I was getting ready to do something. We were going, maybe, I don't remember what. Uh, I just remember I was getting dressed or something. We were getting ready to leave. And he's standing here. He's like, hey, I have a question for you. He said, I was reading my Bible. And what is this valley of the dry bones? <laughs> he's got Ezekiel open. He's, what is this valley of the dry bones? What's that all about? And I was like, wow, man, that's a, that's, that's a prophetic you know, you asked me a tough one. Like, I, I need to really think about that for a little while to give you the right answer. And then he, and I said, I'm getting ready to go somewhere now, but I'll come back to your house tomorrow and, uh, and I'll have an answer ready for you. And I'm thinking, all right, God, I'm going to go back there tomorrow and, uh, and knock on his door. So I need to find a way to turn the valley of the dry bones into a salvation message <laughs> because I need to preach the gospel to him. And I went back. I wasn't able to go the next day or, or I, I went over there. And nobody answered. And so then the following day, I went back again, and, uh, and they were like, yeah, Casey doesn't live here anymore. He moved. Nobody knows where he is. And I'm like, Argh! And so the Lord began to show me, like, look, you need to take advantage of those opportunities when God brings them your way. Here's a guy standing at your door with a Bible open. <laughs> I think whatever I was getting ready to do could wait. <laughs> you know what I mean? I need to say, hey, more importantly than that, <laughs> you know, and show him the gospel. But we need to take advantage of opportunities. And we can't be like, well, I just don't know if I'm going to say the right words. I don't know if, I'm, if I can deal with that passage properly or whatever. We began to make excuses. Well, hey, don't even think about what you're going to say. I mean, don't even be worried about that. Just go up there. You've already prayed for boldness. You prayed for wisdom. You prayed for that God will give you the opportunities. The opportunities there. Start preaching the gospel to them. God will open up the door, you know. And, and, and let me just tell you a real a, a secret here that'll solve a lot of problems. Three words. I don't know. <laughs> if someone asks you a question, and you're like, "Oh no, that's what I was afraid they were going to ask." Question. Here's all you got to do: is say, "You know, I don't know. I'm not really sure." I, can't, I don't think I can answer you on that. But what I can show you is this, and then preach what you know about the gospel. You know, you're saved. How would you get saved? <laughs> and begin to preach the gospel. Okay, number three is the L. So that we had B, pray for boldness to preach the gospel. O, pray for opportunities to boldly preach the gospel. And L is this, pray for laborers to help preach the gospel. Matthew 9, 35. I think praying for these things, seriously praying and begging God for these things is just as important or more important, I should say, than the actual effort of going out there and knocking on the door. I mean, you've got to go out there and put the effort in, but we've got to be spiritually prepared and let, uh, let the Lord do this work for us. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages... By the way, I mean, we love the fact that we're trying to knock on every door in the Kansas City metro, but hey, there's little towns too we need to hit. <laughs> well, you know, there's, we don't want to pass those guys by. And he went teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He's saying, man, the work that I'm here to do, and the Bible says Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. I mean, that was his mission. And he didn't fulfill that in three years. Now, he obviously paid the price uh, the, the, whereby nobody could get saved if he didn't do it. But he said to his disciples, he said, hey, when I'm gone, you're going to do greater works than what you've seen me do. And now nobody has done greater miracles than Jesus, but that's not what he's saying. He's saying the work that you do is going to be more effective than what I did in those three years of my public ministry. 
And so what he means is you're going to take the gospel to the whole world. And through you and the efforts that the disciples did of preaching the gospel, multitudes of people are going to get saved, way more than Jesus was able to get saved uh, in the three years of his public ministry. Uh, and so he, said, he told them that that was going to happen. But here's what he said. Pray that the Lord will send laborers. There's a big job to be done. Now, here, here's an interesting thing. Multitudes of, fo of people followed Jesus. Multitudes of people believed in Jesus. Multitudes of people followed Paul and Peter and all these guys that were doing these great works for the Lord. And uh, it says 5,000 believed on them on that one day. When they preached uh, the day of Pentecost, 3,000 got saved and were added to the church. I mean, lots of multitudes of people. So you say, well, there's a lot of laborers, huh? How many people have we won to the Lord since this work started a year ago? Where are they? <laughs> Where are they? Does that mean they're not saved? We know better than that. But what, what they're not are laborers. <laughs> we need more laborers. Praise the Lord. Uh, Iola has now got a whole lot more laborers than we had whenever I started. Why? We were praying. We were praying, Lord, send us laborers, send us laborers, send us laborers. It's not that we, we couldn't do it, do some of that ourselves, but we're like, Lord, send us laborers. And praise the Lord, this, we ended up starting this work as some time went by. And even now, send us laborers, send us laborers. Hey, when we have a, a soul winning event, we've had a couple of times now where people have come from other places. And we've had big groups of people, uh, people helping us out. I don't know where the laborers are going to come from. They might not be all the people that we get saved out there. They might not all become soul winners. But we need to pray, Lord, give us laborers. We need more people to do this work. We could knock more doors. We could get more souls saved. We need labor so that, therefore, we need to do exactly what Jesus said we need to do. We need to pray for more laborers. <clears throat> we need to do the best that we can to follow up and encourage people, you know. The ones that do get saved, hey, why don't you come out sometime, you know. Uh, the ones that show up, we should say, hey, would you like to come along uh, after the services? We're going to go knocking on some doors. You don't have to say a word. You could just be my silent partner. We could try to train people up. And get them involved in that and show them how to do that. But however we need, however we're going to get these laborers, we just need to pray for them. Let the Lord do that. Somehow, Jesus is saying that the amount of laborers that you get is linked to the amount of prayer you put into getting laborers. Does that make sense? I mean, we can't just go, we, can, we should try, but we can't just go out and make all these things happen. We need to pray, Lord, we need you to give us laborers. We need you to give us boldness. We need you to give us opportunities to preach the gospel. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish this. And the last thing is D. We need to pray for deliverance from evil that would prevent us from preaching the gospel. Um, one of the biggest evils I see that a soul winner faces are dogs. <laughs> we need to pray, Lord, kill those dogs. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Deliver us from evil. The other day we were knocking doors, Brother Nick and I uh, had this big old, this guy, this big old dog. Is, rawr, 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 rawr. And I'm like, oh, whoa, whoa. And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. These dogs won't bite. And these little chihuahuas come and he's like, now those dogs bite. <laughs> but look, I don't care if they bite me or not, but you know what, what they do? I don't know if Satan like possesses them or something like that. I could take a dog bite, okay? I'm not worried about that. But I'm preaching the gospel, and all, the, all this guy's doing the whole time I'm talking to him is like, hey, shut up. Hey, shut up. hey. We gotta, or, or how many of you guys, you knock on the door, and they open up the door just a crack? Yeah. And it's, they're like, oh, oh, oh. And you're like, oh, a dog or a cat's about to run out of that door every single time. And you guys spend about 10 minutes saying, oh, let me help you get the cat. <laughs> I'm like, oh. Well, you know, I, I think we could probably just pray and God could stop some of that stuff from happening. <laughs> we pray for a good silent partner, you know, that knows how to deal with those things. Or the kid, you know, kid is like, mommy, mommy, mommy. And she's trying to hear the gospel and you're like, oh, no, what do I do? Right. These are hindrances that happen every time. And, you know, they do. Someone's listening. Someone's receptive. You're getting ready to give them the most important part. Now, let me show you. Here's how you can know for sure you're going to heaven whenever you die. If you look over here with me, and then all of a sudden a car pulls up. Uh-uh. Hey, you coming? You just lost it. <laughs> right? You just lost it. 
But we can pray, Lord, stop those things from happening or help us deal with them whenever they do happen. Help us have, have the wisdom and ability to stop those. But we need to pray for deliverance from those evil things, for, from interruptions and from distractions, from hindrances, resistance from other family. Uh, I remember I was, I was preaching the gospel. One of my boys were with me. And we were preaching the gospel. No, I think, I think Sharice was with me. We we're preaching the gospel to this lady. And it was cold outside. And this lady was listening. She was, she was really just taking it in, answering all the questions right. And her husband was in the back, and I kept hearing him yell things. And, uh, and all of a sudden, and I could just tell, man, this guy wants me gone. And he's like, oh. every once in a while I see him pace back and forth, and he come back. And, and uh, uh, anyway, his, he's got kids in there, and he's trying to keep them away from, away from us, which I appreciate that. But, uh, but anyway... He comes at one point. It's like the mo- one of the most vital parts of presenting the gospel, Mike. She's just <laughs> she's shaking her head. She remembers. It's like, man, she's fixing to receive the Lord. And, uh, and he's, he comes around the corner and looks at me like, like you need to go. And I just looked. I'm, I'm t- I think the Holy Spirit just empowered me. And I just looked at him and said, I'll be done in a minute. <laughs> he's like, you better. <laughs> But it's like, thank you, Lord. We got rid of, he was fixing to say, you need to go. Close that door. It's cold. My kids need, need their mom. You know, and it would have just totally shut that up. But the Lord was able to, to diffuse that situation. And praise the Lord, she got saved that day. So we need to pray. It's serious. This is, this is a spiritual warfare. We don't battle against flesh and blood, right? There's a spiritual warfare out there. And we need to say, God, and you know, you can do it. We know you can. So we need you to stop some of these distractions, stop some of these hindrances, and, uh, and, and help us to not do that. We need to pray for this. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm still glad at this current time we live in America. I don't know how long it's going to be before we lose some of the rights that we have as Christians and the ability to meet, the ability to go knock doors and all that kind of stuff. But, man, I'm sure glad we're not in, uh, I say I'm glad, if God put us in that situation, I mean, you know, there's some churches in China probably seeing some amazing things happen by the power of the Lord through persecution and all that stuff. So maybe it's what we need, really. Uh, Christians have a little bit of persecution. But, uh, uh, but I am glad, for the most part, that we're pretty free to go out there and knock doors and preach the gospel and all that. But the Bible talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. I've heard some people actually preach from that passage that, see, we need to be praying for the salvation of our leaders, which, praise the Lord, pray for salvation. Send them gospel presentations, you know, by all means. But they'll say, see, he wants all men to be saved. He's saying, pray for your kings and your leaders. You know, that God would save them. He wants all men to be saved. That's not really what the text is saying. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for them or give them the gospel. But what he's saying is pray for them. He says, why? That ye may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And then he's saying, you know, for God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I believe if you read that, what you can see he's saying is that here, here's why you need to pray for your leaders. Because your leaders are making laws, you know, of whether or not you're going to have peace to preach the gospel. <laughs> your, your leaders are the ones that will come close down your services. Your leaders are the ones, you know, will put laws into place to do the, or enforce these different laws. And so you need to pray, Lord, you know, you know we're trying to, do, we're trying to pre- preach the gospel. We're trying to get people saved. We need you to just, you know, get some of these wicked people uh, you know, away from us, not hindrance. I'm not saying everybody in law enforcement or whatever is wicked, but I'm just saying that's what our prayer needs to be. You say, well, what if some wicked person gets in there? What are we going to do now? Hey, it doesn't matter who the person is. I mean, who's he praying for? Who's Paul got in his day and age? Nero? I mean, you know, the Caesars? You think they were good men? 
You think they passed laws that were profitable for Christians? No, but see, here's the thing. Even in, uh, even in this passage right here, actually, uh, let me see. I didn't write it down, but Acts 4 is uh, where our text is. Let's see if I can find it real quick. This could be dangerous. Going off script. The Holy Spirit will give me the right words. <laughs> All right, so, you know, these guys have arrested him, and uh, they've taken him before the council. Where were those chief priests, Sadducees, all that kind of stuff? And, uh, and look at, uh, let me see here. Oh, my. Man, I can't remember. Is it in the next chapter, maybe? Uh, uh, no, this guy, wasn't his name Gaius? No, that's not it. That's not, that's not the right name. But there's a guy that comes and he's like the, he's like the person in charge. And, uh, and he basically tells them that, you know, if they're doing, if they're doing evil, you know, uh, let's see, he, he, he talks about, uh, uh, lewd. If they're in there, if they're, if it's lewdness or man, I shouldn't have went off script. 34. Okay. Uh, I don't know. That's not 34. Oh, 534. Mm -hmm. There it is. Okay. Thank you. Gamaliel. I don't know why I said Gaius. All right. 34. Thank you. We'll edit that part out of that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> when they heard that they were cut to their heart. All right. He's preaching in front of these people and they took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days uh, uh, rose up Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain and, and, uh, slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as men. Now I say unto you, refrain from these men. And let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they, were called, uh, when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. That's actually not what I was talking about, but it's the same thing. This, uh, this, it hap this happens more than once. And here's the deal. Do you think that this man, he was a Pharisee. Do you think that he was just all of a sudden a good man? No, he was a guy that didn't, he, 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 he didn't like what Paul was doing either. He didn't like what they were doing. And so we might have leaders in power that come on the scene and they hate Christians just as much as any other wicked ruler, right? But God can alter. I don't care who, who wins the next election. I don't care who's in power. I don't care who locally is in charge of making laws. God can use it to where there's some influence upon them, you know, where they have to allow God's people to be able to do whatever they're doing. We've seen that happen a lot of times, you know. Uh, they're right now they're fighting with our governor, who's a, who's kind of a wicked person of Kansas, and uh, and they're fighting against against her orders to shut down services and all that kind of stuff. Look, we're not concerned about who's in charge. Our prayer about the people that are, are in charge is Lord. Help them to make laws that are going to keep us at peace and give us the freedom to be able to preach the gospel and get more safe. So, so we need to even pray for our rulers. Now, I'm closing, I'm closing this down here. Romans 13. Romans 13. I bet you this is where I was supposed to be. I'm sorry. But that was the same, pretty much the same story happened there uh, to Peter as it did here in, uh, to Paul in, in Romans 13. So we're not going to go there, though. But Romans 13 right now is one of the most quoted verse, uh, quoted passages of Scripture <laughs> in regards to what we're supposed to do with our leaders 
and our rulers. Okay, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoso therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then uh, not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And you could go on and on and on, but here's the thing. All throughout the Bible, there are good examples. And I was telling my wife, I want to preach a message one of these days called How to Rebel <laughs> or How to Be a Rebel, something like that. There are people in the Bible who had to go against the authorities, okay? But they did it in a godly manner. And it wasn't all about, let me just show the government, you know. No, we should respect the government. We should pay our taxes. We should obey the laws that they put in force up until the point where it infringes upon the higher powers, okay? Which one higher power is actually the Constitution, the way our law is set up. Amen. But then a higher power than that is God. Amen. If you disagree with the Constitution because it breaks what the Bible says, the Bible's right. And that's what I'm going to go by. Even if it means going to jail or whatever the case, the higher power is God. No other power is given by anybody but God. And so, uh, and so we don't need to just take this flippant attitude that says, hey, just hey, whatever the government says, I mean, you just need to obey the government. No, we need to pray that we will, as much as possible, be able to live at peace with others and live at peace with our government the way that it is right now. But look at Acts chapter 4 again. Acts chapter 4, this is the last verse. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. He's saying, you, you think I should obey you more than I should obey God? <laughs> is that really what you think? You know? Now, he wasn't being a, a rebel rouser. He wasn't trying to cause problems. He's just saying, you know, what I'm preaching is what God has ordained me to preach. And what through the Holy Spirit has given me boldness to preach and to proclaim. And guess what? You're not going to stop that. Okay. And he's saying, that, he's saying it as, as respectfully as he can, I believe, just like Paul does later on when, when he's dealing with government, just like Jesus did whenever he dealt with government. There were times when they had to disobey the government because God's will was more important than the government. Uh, but there was a way that they did it. And so we need to just pray that God will allow us not to have to make those kind of fights, not to have to go through those kinds of things. But if they do, hey, we've been praying for boldness. We've been praying for laborers. We've been praying for opportunities to preach the gospel. All these kinds of things are going to work together for good. All right? If we're trying to do the will of God and we're praying for His help, and we're praying for His will to be done and to empower us by the, by the Holy Spirit. He's going to make sure that we're able to accomplish that. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the opportunity to serve You, uh, to assemble together with Your people, and also to go out knocking doors. I thank You for the great results that we've had in sharing the gospel, uh, planting lots of seeds uh, where we didn't see people get saved, but they're hearing the gospel. But thank You for those who've uh, received your word and have called on you uh, to save them, Lord. I pray that you'll uh, help us have the opportunity to follow up on some of these and and encourage them to go the next step and do those things that accompany salvation. But Father, whatever happens, I pray that you would give us laborers, and give us more opportunities to do more for you in these last days. So much the more as we see the day approaching, Father, help us to uh, to do the work you've called us to do and to do it to the best of our ability. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.